Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, sticking around. We'll have uh, a brief debate. We have the room until 9 p.m., so we have roughly 15 minutes. Um, it gives me great pleasure to moderate today's debate. My name is Philippe Calvin, and I'm an assistant professor in anthropology and sociology uh, here at the Institute. Um, we thought about having a very sort of quick two round of questions among our uh, distinguished panel of experts, and then we really want to give the floor to the audience, so if you'll bear with us for about 15 minutes or so, we'll, you'll actually have the word uh, in a little bit. Um, and I will be introducing our speakers one at a time, raising a question. I will start on my left with uh, Debupriya Banerjee, a uh, Forex specialist at Symbiotics, who happens to be one of our alumni. Uh, she holds a Master's in International Economics. Uh, from the Institute in 2017, and she was named uh, a, one of the 100 leaders of tomorrow at the St. Gallen Symposium with an essay who proposed, which proposed forward-looking uh, solutions and a global approach to the problem of what are the alternatives to economic growth. And the first question I had for you is um, your first reaction, impressions about the documentary that we just saw. Uh, well, uh, the film is indeed very topical and it raises some very legitimate and uncomfortable questions that we are unwilling to address on a daily basis. And the fact, I mean, we all know that capitalism stems from the inherent need to have constant growth and it is expanding consumer demand that drives economic growth, like across, across decades up until now. I have three uh, main key takeaways from the film. Uh, the first one is that I believe that the system has become so entrenched in our daily life or as a way of life, as we can say, is because of a political narrative that has been built around what is growth and what it stands for, and more to look at it from a competitive aspect. Because after the World War, there had been an ideological war as to which faction or which side of the world should be more, de should be more developed or should be developing, uh, uh, like uh, with respect to resource accumulation or with respect to just general prosperity levels. So it has been mainly this feature that has been pushing forward the idea of capitalism to have the need for constant growth in order to prove that we are better than the next other country that is out there. Well, that's the first one. Uh, the second one would be that the film, I believe, in my opinion, it takes a bit of a one-sided perspective on the issues, as in it looks at it from a very developed country point of view. Because over here, we look at all the major economies and see how their financial markets have been growing and how they have been addressing the issue of growth. But it is important to remember that there are billions out there who are still left with no access to resources, languishing in poverty, and with very low levels of social indicators. So in such a situation, or in those countries, it is important that economic growth pursues. Because if you look at the very standard method of GDP calculation, and I know that the film dissed the calculation of GDP big time, but at the same, but if you look at the income method, or which is basically just value added by every working member of the population, if you have population growth, and at the same time, no economic growth. It means that it is a stagnating society because here, the level of capital or the per capita level of capital is already low, below that of the developed countries. And so if you have that stagnating and with that population growing at the same time, so with every subsequent year where there are new people entering the workforce, there needs to be a certain level of means available to provide them with the basic incomes. So I feel that there needs to be a distinction that one should make between economic growth as a phenomenon and capitalism as an ideology. And although the two go hand in hand, one cannot deny the importance of economic growth, especially in the developing market context. And the third thing that I would like to say is that 
Uh, the film is very spot on when it talks about financial markets and uh, the, the amount of riskiness that is associated with it and the, and the fact that it has been very instrumental in propagating the idea of capitalism, especially in the Western European and North American countries. But financial industry is a lot more than that. And perhaps I have a bit of a biased opinion considering that I work in impact investing, but uh, at the end of the day, humanity still hasn't found an alternative to money. And money remains the basis of determination of wealth and a means of exchange. And the financial system, what it does is it facilitates these exchanges. So financial mobility, sophistication, and credit growth do bring about real improvements in levels of prosperity in countries. And so it is important that we look at it from both ways. I mean, for sure, the financial industry can do a lot of harm, but it is also a lot more than just Wall Street and guys in expensive suits. It's also lending money and providing capital for people to grow their businesses, be it as small as a farmer who wants to start his own little project in some, in some remote village in Tajikistan. Well, yeah, that's it. So. Thank you, uh, Dubopriya. Uh, maybe uh, to my far left, uh, Sophie Swaton, uh, um, senior lecturer at the Institute of Geography and Sustainability in our neighboring University of Lausanne, who has long-standing both research record on issues of sustainability, social and solidarity economies, and has recently published uh, in English for an ecological sustainable income, or in French, pour un revenu de la transition écologique. Uh, your first reaction to the documentary, its main strengths and weaknesses, perhaps based on your own intellectual trajectory? Yes, I think that the film shows very well that all economists are right. Growth is based on the destruction of natural resources. <laughs> and the belief that we can always find a technological substitution to this natural destruction. But the fact is that it doesn't work anymore. And the more we produce, the more we destroy our own resources without being able to replace it. That's the point. So uh, this economical model, I think, should be totally removed. And uh, what I think also is that the film shows two main limits. Uh, first of all, I think that it does not go further in the roots of our psychological belief in this economical model. That is a system error, in fact. Uh, this model leads to the collapse of our societies. We all know that. But we have a lot of reports, the GIEC, a lot, a lot of reports, but we ignore it. So why? There is a psychological dimension. And secondly, I would say that the film of course, it's focused on, on Marx, <laughs> on a criticism on capitalism, but maybe a limit is that it doesn't show enough the, what would be the solution. And it is not only Marx's uh, viewpoint, but we could also, at the 19th century, speak about Proudhon, Fourier, Owen, Gilles, and all show also alternative through a new kind of organization. For instance, cooperative, cooperation, involving a new philosophy, cooperation. So what I want to say is that it's not only an economical problem, but also, I would say, a philosophical or a spiritual one. Okay, I... I <laughs> and the question will be, what makes us happy? It's also an individual question, not only institutional viewpoint, but also individual one. Uh, is consumption the only issue? Why do we believe in the market like a god? And why do we deny the issue of climate change? What are the role of emotions? So I strongly think that we also have to face all these questions too. Thank you, Sophie. Um, so, to conclude our introduction of the panelists, I'll give the word to Daniel Badu, 
um, who's been collaborating with a series of environmental and ecological uh, NGOs, and he's also a member of the, uh, in English, the degrowth or the growth objection network, or in French, Le Réseau Objection de Croissance, which uh, was born here in Geneva roughly 10 years ago, which seeks to contest this doctrine of economic growth and puts forth and takes seriously the idea that not only another world is possible, but it's actually necessary. So on that note, Danielle, perhaps you can offer us a couple of thoughts on the documentary. Uh, maybe let's keep it brief so that we can then pursue the conversation. So thank you. Um, my opinion about the movie, I found it quite good. Um, I usually don't like these kind of movies. Uh, so I said quite good. At least it's enter entertaining. It's well, well uh, created. I mean, the, the scenes, how, how they, they go one form, um, uh, and how they, um, the succession of, of scenes. Um, well, to me, the movie, uh, the advantage is the, the movie shows well that we're going uh, to collapse. Uh, at least to me. Um, it shows well the regression, the general regression that uh, sometimes um, is hidden by uh, a focus that is uh, given by sustainable development. Uh, if you have a larger picture, um, I think the general situation is a regression. And uh, it, it shows well that we are in a very special moment of history where we are at the top of something and either we go, we go on. I mean, if, if, we, if we look at human history, it's like far from there, it goes flat, a little bit of growth, tiny bit of growth, and so, suddenly there's an acceleration, huge acceleration, and we are there at the top. So either it goes on and we are become God, gods. It's like it's one, one of the guys was more or less talking about this scenario. Either we crash down, and uh, if you rotate the, the graph, maybe it goes on there, but... There's a, there's a roof top there. Uh, one guy was talking about the sky as a limit, so I don't know. Um, I find it too bad that it was quite simple the way they explain uh, environmental, ecological mechanism, uh, just saying that it, uh, we can't grow infinitely in a, in a finite world, world is, is a bit too, uh, too simple. Uh, it's a it's, um, fail on the occasion to explain more the mechanism between um, resources and growth uh, as a factor of production uh, resources. Um, <coughs> it looks like the, the movie is it's, it's presented as it's quite neutral, but it's not really in the end. And uh, I think the last words come um, without a real transition and building an argu uh, uh, the arguments and um, how we come from the beginning to the, to the end. I, I found it a bit harsh how, how the last words come. Um, and of course, there's a lot of psychological uh, aspect uh, about how we live in this world. And uh, I, 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 just, um, I just, I'm just gonna give a few highlights of the movie for example, and how, how people are um, either we go on, either we crash. For example, there's this guy, the first guy in Brazil said, he arrived and he said, there was nothing here. Let's think about that. There was nothing here when, when it was plenty of things. It was a huge amount of life and there's nothing now. Uh, this, this was quite uh, shocking for me. And the guy who says, uh, is asked, is it a structural uh, crisis or not? And he, he doesn't reply. And he doesn't reply. So for me, it was quite, um, it's, it's, a, it's actually a reply. It's a way of communicating when you, you don't communicate. Uh, and this Chinese guy saying we are making the world smaller, he's, I think he's actually participating, he's joining us in making the world smaller. The carrying capacity of the earth is, is getting smaller. That's what, what, what it means to me. And, um, and finally, uh, there's a guy who uh, I think is a, is a trader. He says, it scares me at the situation. He is the one who really says what, what's in the, in the back of their mind. He, they, are actually, they are actually quite scared. Um, I think most of them, really, if we ask them truly.
Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, thank you also for the audience for being so patient. I just have one final question to our panelists before I give you the word, but I would like our panelists to be as brief as possible, perhaps a yes or no answer with a sentence so that we have enough time for the audience. And the question is rather complex. Is Where do you stand vis-a-vis uh, -vis the big question of economic or not growth, yes or no? Um, do you think the alternative to growth is needed? Uh, if yes, how would that look not look like? If not, how do you envision the possibility of a sustainable future? Um, so perhaps we can follow the same order. Uh, yes or no, where do you stand in the economic growth debate? Well, an alternative to growth is certainly needed, but the way to get there is difficult because, like I said before, the system is so entrenched in our everyday way of life, it is difficult to dismantle an existing ideology in pursuit of a new one. And besides, how do you convince consumers to change their spending habits? How do we tell them that, yes, because of your excess consumption, rainforests in the Amazon are getting destroyed? So it is easy to sit here and say that, yes, alternatives are needed and there's a lot we could do, but it is difficult to actually implement them in policy because everything, because like businesses and industries and production facilities are built to cater to our needs. And it is difficult to break all of that down, to break down all the supply chains because of the trade linkages that exist between all the countries. Sophie, you've, uh, you've written about this. Uh, where do you stand in this debate? Um, I think that clearly growth showed limits and uh, inequality and social and environmental inequality still are still increasing. Um, yes, so I think that now growth and GDP do not produce employment anymore. It was really clear in the film. And so they do not produce employment uh, enough and they destroy really our planet. So. As Tim Jackson explained, uh, GDP and new technology cannot be the only solution. They can't. And the way we produce our own way of life has to be resolved. But our societies are still focused on this indicator, GDP, uh, that need to be redefined. So what will be really uh, a new indicator take into account negative externality? So I strongly think that we should support organization with um, social and um, environmental good impact. So organizations that do not just pursue profits, but that produce in the limit of the earth, not to take more than what the planet can support. For example, circular economy, uh, social economy, or alternative model that still, that still create new jobs with positive impact on earth people, and also animals. Thank you. Uh, Danielle, as a member of the Growth Objection Network, I assume what your position in the debate is, but let's hear it. Well, we have to choose. Uh, either we uh, choose growth, uh, actually our level of incomes, and we sacrifice everything else, or we choose uh, to go as, so, as close as possible to, to a sustainable state and we sacrifice our, uh, our income. That's, if you look at the, this debate, it's, it, the fundamental question is about, is it possible to decouple the uh, ecological impact from um, uh, the size of the economy and its evolution, so growth? And you, it's a debate, but it's not so much uh, addressed. And um, if, if you look at the demonstration on both sides of, the, of both camps, you'll see um, demonstration from the UNEP, UNEP, for example. Is it really demonstrative? Is it really convincing? And look at all the alternatives that are not so much um, put uh, in the, in the, on the scene. Ecological economics, for example, that is not taught anymore in Geneva, I think. It used to be. Um, now it's more like environmental economics. It's not the same at all, so I, I, I think students should um, get information about that. Tim Jackson is a star uh, in ecological economics, but I have his book in French here if you want. There's a chapter saying, uh, like demonstrating from one angle that it's not possible to, to, to grow without um, sacrificing the uh, environmental environment. Um, there's many angles to, to, to show that. So I think 
uh, we should either uh, go for the crash and enjoy uh, until last moment, or uh, anticipate and make it um, not so bad. I mean, it, it's it's too late clearly to to avoid the crash, but we can we can make it more or less manageable. Uh, uh, and the technology as a solution for me is a, is a big illusion. It's, it's people living in another world. Uh, I'm, 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 a, I'm a train driver, I'm a train conductor, mm -hmm. and um, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I studied here too. I have a master's degree from this institute. But um, I think if you really work uh, with things, you realize that it's a big illusion. It's never going to happen, in my opinion. I might be wrong, but I, if I'm wrong, I think we, it's going to be worse. We're going to be in a worse situation. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, we have the full spectrum of positions here, but I think uh, it's time to give you the, the word. I would be very curious to hear where you stand in this debate. Is there a limit to growth? Are we in a finite uh, world and thus economic growth is impossible as it has been uh, um, the case over the last century or so? Um, so there's some kind assistants uh, who will be passing around a microphone. I see a first question here. Um, uh, bonsoir. Et pourquoi le, le problème central du film, c'est de savoir quel est le développement actuel à quoi va conduire et Marx, la théorie marxiste, a répondu à cette question. Il a dit, il a écrit que le système capitaliste, le mode de production capitaliste, n'est pas éternel. À quelque part, elle va se autodétruire. Le système capitaliste de production aujourd'hui a détruit la nature a détruit la terre, a détruit toutes les ressources naturelles. Et nous vivons à crédit, il n'y a plus de ressources biologiques naturelles sur la terre. À cette question de vie et mort, il faut répondre avec des questions scientifiques, comme Marx elle a posé cette question. Merci. Um, maybe we can take a second question. Uh... I'd like to hitch on to what Sophie Soiton said about the psychological dimension of the problem. Mm -hmm. We live in a society where millions, hundreds of millions of people are totally manipulated by advertising and the system and beliefs to believe that they need always more consumers, the last model, etc. I have been living for over 50 years recording that wonderful statement in the Tao Te Ching he who knows he has enough is rich. I haven't had a car for over 50 years. I had one for uh, one, one year when I was young. I don't have TV. I've been f living frugally, but I have a deep inner contentment because I've discovered that contentment has nothing to do with consumption. So I think there's also a psychological and even spiritual dimension to the issue. We have to change simply our vision of life, of what true happiness is. I've been corresponding for 23 years with an extraordinary death row inmate in Texas who's become <clears throat> a man of international stature and has influenced thousands of people by his vision of life. And when he was still on death row, he wrote to one of my friends, even if I have to die on death row, I will at least have shown that it will prove that one can be happy here. So deep happiness is not a level of question of consumption, but a question of a certain vision of life. So these were more uh, two general comments, if I'm allowed to maybe pitch the panelists. Uh, do you think that indeed, as Marx would have it, that the system contains its own seeds of destruction? Um, and ultimately, I think the last question or last comment also raises the question of, of what we can as individuals uh, do towards a more sustainable future. So perhaps uh, if you want to share some thoughts with us on any of those uh, problems. Alors, la première question est en français. Je, du coup, je switch. <laughs> J'en profite. <laughs> um, 
Oui, uh, I, I can speak English otherwise. But the first, the, the, la, la première question donc, sur Marx, vous avez raison. Uh, il a montré que le système uh, conduisait à sa propre perte, que le, finalement, c'est ce à quoi on arrive avec les GAFA, uh, qu'il n'y aurait plus qu'une seule grosse structure qui s'auto-alimenterait et que le système en lui-même contenait sa propre destruction. On est complètement d'accord. Par contre, j'apprécie cette vision, mais sur la destruction du capital naturel, il faut remonter encore avant, qu'on montrait tous les économistes, et sur l'effondrement des civilisations, c'est arrivé bien avant l'analyse marxiste. Si on prend l'Empire romain, même sous Platon, à l'époque grecque, grec, il y a eu déjà des signes de collapsologie, il y a déjà eu une histoire, une alerte sur l'effondrement de nos civilisations. Donc, ce n'est pas quelque chose qui arrive uniquement avec Pablo Servine en 2017, enfin, de, oh, oh, 2000, pardon, 2015, et puis son nouveau livre l'année dernière. On est, c est, ce sont des choses récurrentes auxquelles nos civilisations ont toujours été confrontées. Et ce que je voulais dire, peut-être plus facile du coup là, euh, c'est qu'au-delà de la seule dimension d'un dérèglement des institutions, c'est aussi, ça rejoint la deuxième question, un problème des règlements humains sur un ancrage. Un ancrage. Et donc, on assiste à partir du XVIIe siècle à un changement de paradigme où la richesse n'est plus seulement dans la possession d'esclaves, Aristote pensait l'esclavage, mais dans l'accumulation de biens. Et ça, ça arrive bien avant Marx. Donc, mon point, et Marx était hegelien, et Marx était philosophe. Donc, c'est de dire que cette analyse qu'il a parfaitement montrée, Marx, elle remonte quand même à plusieurs siècles auparavant et sur une question de transition intérieure, de valeur, de spiritualité. Donc la question, et je rejoindrai la deuxième, c'est que uh, I, I totally agree with your viewpoints. We need a spiritual dimension. We need to understand why we consume, why we need to have so much goods, cars, and the answering of this question will be the key point to understand the system error. That's my conviction. Um, Daniel, do you want to add something that you would feel so? Uh, yes. Um, uh, alors je, fais, je réponds aussi à la première question en, en français, du coup. Um, bilingue, quand même. Enfin, presque bilingue. Um, oui, c'est vrai que... Um, ça remonte à avant, euh, clairement. Il y a eu un méga best-seller, c'est Sapien, qui fait cette histoire. Euh, en, bien meilleur encore, deux fois plus long, c'est euh, Cataclysme. Malheureusement, je ne me souviens plus le nom de l'auteur, c'est assez la honte. Mais... Et donc, il y a un livre qui s'appelle Cataclysme, qui est écrit par un Français, dont le prénom est Nicolas, je pense. Et, euh, et il fait vraiment très, très bien cette histoire de l'humanité. Euh, et c'est passionnant, je vous le recommande vivement. Euh, moi, je, je, je suis d'accord avec vous, je ne sais pas trop quoi répondre. Euh, il est vrai qu'il faut répondre avec la science, mais où est la science aujourd'hui et, et euh, où est-ce qu'on trouve les informations Je pense qu'il faut aller un peu dans les alternatives, parce que si on regarde les, les documents de l'ONU, UNEP par exemple, euh, bon, on est, on est dans cette croissance verte. Et, et, euh, voilà, c'est ce que je dis, donc ce qu'il faut, qu faut faire, c'est aller voir les gens qui sont à la retraite. Qui, qui sont à la retraite de UNEP et qui... Par, 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 par exemple, ou, ou l'économie écologique ou ce genre de choses. Um, voilà, je, je passe à la suite. Uh, the second question was in English. Uh, about manipulation. Of course, we are manipulated, but this is to sustain the system, this growing... Uh, system to, to sustain growth. This is, this is the way we, we try everything. So uh, at some point it gets really ridiculous uh, out of all, any common sense. But why? why? The question is why? Uh, why is it done like that? And uh, how are we, what are we ready to sacrifice to, to, to go out of this thing? Um, uh, because oh, I had some notes, but... Um, Because this is what, 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 what uh, sustaining also everything that is quite entertaining for us. And of course, we, we have to be very philosophical, to have very philosophical um, thinking to go out. But think about just education, health system, 
um, culture is depending on growth. And we have to imagine a world where we have much less money and to uh, imagine these, everything, these things that are very uh, entertaining, that we like. Geneva is quite uh, fun to live in. So we have to imagine all of thing, these things with much less money. And this is not mm -hmm. easy. And this is where uh, that's true. There's a lot of psychological aspect about that. And we uh, tell us stories to make it uh, uh, standable, to, to cope with this, uh, based on, in my opinion, and we ignore things. We deny. So this is what makes us able to uh, think about tomorrow just as today. And we blind ourselves with illusions, uh, thinking that it's gonna, gonna bring solutions. Um, and about your question, is it seeds, the system has, has its seeds of destructions? I'd say yes, the, the profits. This, this idea of everything has to uh, end up with profits. Think about the internet. What's, what's the main use of internet today? It's a, it was probably a great idea, but uh, lol cats and porn. Um, yeah. Deborah, you want to add something? Uh, yes, I'd like to answer the second question. Well, what drives capitalism is aspiration. There is a constant desire to have more than what you have. And because I'm an economist, I would like to say that there is a reason why we have an assumption of a rational economic consumer, because, because that is what we like we, what we have we would always want to have more than that and this is what drives profits this is why we build industries which is why we consume more than what we already have so it is difficult to say that you should take a deep look and understand what happiness is but when you look into the developing countries which are taking inspiration from the Western world to determine what their indicators of development are, you will see that there will be an increase in the demand for cars and more clothes because that is what is believed is the sign of growth. And I mean, it is only after a country or a society has reached a level of prosperity that you understand, that you can take a step back and really reflect on what the values of human life are. But when there are billions in poverty, it is very hard to reflect on, on what true happiness means because probably they don't know what that is, as, uh, except, with the, except with the presence of uh, some very uh, like economic goods and services. Thank you. Uh, before I, I pass the word again to the audience, I just want to call your attention to the fact that uh, outside as you leave the auditorium, there's a little uh, reading and uh, other kinds of resources recommended uh, linked to the documentary that you just watched. So a series of organizations that you can be organized in and uh, additional resources to continue your own reflection. Uh, on that note, I would like to pass the word to um, there over there in the middle. Thank you. Uh, my name is Elias. I'd like to ask you, because um, what we've seen in this documentary is pretty much the Western perspective. So my question is, what alternatives or what recommendations will you give to the emerging countries, precisely the developing countries? Shall we replace the word growth by the word spirituality? Thank you. Um, I see a couple of hands over there, so maybe we can collect a second question before returning to the panel. I don't know if it's a question. I'm not used to asking questions. I have very much hope in young people because a lot of them are beginning to realize that we're en train de foncer dans le mur, as we say in French. And I think they're becoming aware that having more is not always... Um, living better. Um, the other thing is, it's been mentioned in the beginning of the film, the GDP is calculated according to how much money is handled. So if you're taking medicines that make you sick, this makes the GDP grow. If you have a big disaster, 
or many big or small medium disasters, it makes the GDP grow. This is not progress as such. This is not really a very interesting um, development. As for countries which are still poor or underdeveloped, what are we doing? We're sending our rubbish to them, and we're polluting them, and we're sending our nasty chemicals and our interesting um, means of doing um, so-called modern agriculture, which is actually ruining the ground. Um, it would be interesting if they tried something else. Thank you. Uh, I suggest that maybe the panel has a, a quick response so that we have a final round of questions from the audience before we close the session. So does anyone want to take any of the questions? Uh, in response we'll to the first, yeah, in response to the first question, no, we cannot replace economic growth with spirituality, at least not just yet. Unless the people who are living below the poverty lines or where their social indicators are still not to the accepted levels, we need a certain level of growth to get to, to get to a dignified level of existence. And then perhaps we can think about what spirituality is and what happiness is. But until then, no, we need to be able to provide them with the capital to have like a normal, or, or like at least the level, uh, or the level of uh, livelihood that is existing in the developed countries at this point of time. Thank you. 30 seconds, 30 seconds. Oh. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, de um, uh, de de developing countries, uh, so-called developing countries. I studied development uh, studies, and for me, uh, as a Swiss, it was a problem of the North development. Uh, we are overdeveloped, and uh, I hope that I, I don't feel um, legit legitimate to say what what you should do, but I hope you 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 can have another way. I hope so. Um, but at least here, from here, what we should do is us first uh, go down, like um, lower the, the, the ecological impact, reduce, and it leads to um, a massive uh, decrease of our income. This is, we have to be very clear about, about that. And the more we uh, wait to do that, the, the, the worse it's going gonna, it's gonna to get, it's going to be. So uh, this is something that we have to take into account, that all those years without doing anything destroy a lot of potential that were uh, still possible. Uh, like three years ago, there was many pot potentials that are not uh, existing anymore. Um, about the GDP, actually, I don't, I don't even think it's a, such a bad indicator. It's just, we should just take it for what it is and not, not more, not less, and, and put other indicators uh, aside. That's my opinion, and uh, about the north and uh, south, so-called north and so-called south uh, relation, that, that's true, that you're absolutely right. We, uh, just think about China now, uh, not accepting anymore the, the rubbish from, uh, from USA, it's, it's becoming a big problem. And uh, think about the Swiss success. We export uh, 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 primary, secondary sectors of the economy far. Uh, we take back the products of these economies for a cheap price, so we are winner, winner, and um, we account the, the energy saving in our um, accounting, the, the, how, how we reduce the, the, the ecological impact. And very Swiss specific, we take back the money because the companies are here. So think about if you change that, how Switzerland change. That's it. Yes, um, <clears throat> it's a very interesting question, and I think uh, as Western countries, we maybe don't need, uh, I agree with you, to teach, but maybe to learn also <laughs> from other countries and uh, um, what exists and already, and also how to mix new and low technologies. Um, I mean also how we can protect ancestral knowledge. That's very interesting, how we can rediscover uh, kind of ancestral knowledge that was already known and that we have forgotten in each of our country. And maybe also we need altogether to develop public infrastructure not only 
to think that what is to be developed is to give access to the market for water, for example. Or maybe we need also to see what already exists and how sometimes uh, protecting the common can be interesting in a third way, not only our state or all the market, but maybe the medium way that uh, trusts intermediaries, that trusts communities, that trusts people. Maybe that would be uh, something interesting way, but not only <laughs> for every, every country, but in this way too. And I think uh, concerning the GDP, we, we really need to take into account other indicators. It's really a stupid one. This one. <laughs> we, we think that wellness is to destroy the planet. How can we only take this one into account? We should really think about other one. And in the link also to spirituality and to emotional and... Uh, we really need to produce new imaginary. We need arts, we need movies, we need creation that lead us to produce new way of life. And far from replacing us and leaving relationships by, by, by robots, totally stupid. So we still are humans and we, are not, we, not, we do not have a bee planet. So let's take care of it and uh, let's take care of people. So we have to take a final round of questions. We have less than 10 minutes, so we'll start there and then move behind. And then we'll collect other two very quick questions or comments, please. Um, so the, the film comments uh, has a comment about how um, there's no other organism in the world or biologically that can continue on this type of growth without killing its host. And it makes me think of a virus. Uh, and I'm curious what you think about humanity in that sense and whether it's natural the way we aspire to have more and more and if there is a way for us to get past that or how you feel about this concept of, of growing in a, in a virus type way. Thank you very much. Uh, for me, the, the film had a, a different, or maybe not different, but a deeper underlying message. And this was, how do we, or what do we value? Do we value tuna dead as a commodity, or do we value tuna alive? Do we value forest alive, or do we value forest dead, and so on. And, I think it's interesting that the notion of rethinking value hasn't been discussed today. And I think there are a lot of initiatives going on where the value is being redefined, rediscussed. There are a number of economists. We know the prime minister in New Zealand introduced the well-being budget. So things are uh, happening. And I'm curious uh, why this is not kind of more coming up. And I feel that every citizen, each of us, has an enormous power to rethink what, what is valuable and influence the system wherever we are. And then we can come together and, of course, educational institutions like Graduate Institute, University of Lausanne, and several others around the world had enormous role to play to, re to help us re rethink and empower students uh, to rethink what do we value in our society. We will soon be expelled from the room, so I, I urge you to be as brief as possible. There's one over there, and then we'll move uh, to the front. And then final Thanks. question. I, we'll see if we can still take, please. Thanks, I'll be, I'll be very brief. Uh, just, um, uh, we hear all the time right now uh, from sometimes very well-meaning politicians that uh, it is possible to, um, continue with some kind of economic growth by means and investment in so-called green technologies. Uh, you know, the, this whole Green New Deal in the U.S. is one, one example of that. And others say this is a, this is a, a myth. We, you know, this, this is not possible to, to grow your way out of this problem. Can I, if the uh, panelists could possibly comment on whether, um, you know, actually investing in, in technological solutions is a myth or um, is it part of the solution? Thank you. There's one over here. Thank you for being brief. Okay. Um, I'd like to talk about the crack or the collapsology that many people talk about now. It's, uh, I think to me, it's a big uh, trap 
the, we underestimate the ability to the system we live in to train new people that are going to be able to sell this ideology constantly. So our schools, political system, everything around us that we rely on is intentionally or not corrupted. So if we really want to fight against those, we should not rely on this kind of uh, make a loan and do some green energy. Uh, everything that we rely on right now is just copy-pasting what the system is doing and we're saying, oh, we're going to do something better. And I think this is, when you say, de uh, pobria, uh, when you say that there is um, no, um, no way that uh, small countries are relying on uh, religion or um, uh, psychology or you know what I mean? Um, I think this is already the case. It's either you have capitalism on one side or you rely on a religion just to make you, it's every, I think Bob Marley once time said, uh, every need get an ego to feed. So people are just pushed in this, into this direction. And uh, I feel strong, but I cannot resist to sometimes like doing a loan or buying something that I don't need. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so 15 seconds each of you. Uh, I really want to give you the opportunity to share your thoughts, uh, but in order to return to the panelists. Thank you so much. I just wanted to quickly share a thought or a supposition that um, this growth is absolutely stimulated. Um, maybe less in some countries, maybe much more in others. Uh, if we would e at least cut out um, or cut, out, cut down on the advertising, cut off uh, eventually, cut out the advertising, this would help a lot. I mean, people are just driven to consume. Uh, they don't feel the need. Um, when I was younger, okay, I needed a few things. I bought this, that, and so on to get along in life, but now I don't feel I need it. I, I've had things for years which are great. Uh, you, I can use them constantly. It's, I've fallen into the trap. Now and then I buy a small thing. But I mean, if we just stop this adver stupid advertising, and there are so many people um, devoting their skills to this, especially young, uh, young, um, young ones, I think this is just crazy. I, I th if we cut this out, this would help quite a lot, I think. Bonsoir. Je vais m'exprimer en français afin d'être fluide. Si vous voulez le traduire, vous êtes le, le bienvenu. Non, non, mais c'est juste. Euh, J'ai une question qui est liée en fait à deux citations que je vais lire maintenant. Et je la poserai uniquement à, Madame Banner, à Mademoiselle Banerjee, puisque les deux autres intervenants ne seront pas, à mon avis, concernés par la question. La première citation est un dicton chinois qui dit « La face est aux hommes ce que l'écorce est aux arbres ». Et la deuxième citation est, une, est empruntée à Upton Sinclair, qui est une personnalité qui a vécu au XXe siècle et qui, dans le cadre de, ses, euh, de son investigation dans les, la, euh, les abattoirs de Chicago, a dit « Il est difficile de faire comprendre quelque chose à quelqu'un qui tire ses revenus du fait de ne pas le comprendre. » Et donc c'est la question que je pose à Mademoiselle Banerjee, c'est qu'est-ce qu'elle pense de, cette, de ces deux citations quand on les imbrique l'une à l'autre Voilà, mais bon. Um, Alors les citations. Non. La, 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 si vous voulez, la deuxième, c'est il est difficile de faire comprendre quelque chose à quelqu'un qui tire ses revenus du, du fait de ne pas le comprendre. That was a tough one for to conclude uh, if we wanted to be very, I know, very I know. brief. Um, so let's just conclude the debate by returning the word to our panelists. Uh, there's a lot that you can potentially reflect upon uh, from value, the virus, the Green New Deal, the problem of advertising, capitalism and religion. Um, so I will give you the opportunity to explore perhaps one or two of these issues. We won't have time to cover them all. 
So, um, Sophie, do you want to start? Uh, yes, very quickly. Uh, rethinking values, I think it's a, a really a key point, of course. And uh, values is the big economic <laughs> question since the 19th century and before, uh, of course, with Marx, but not oh no, what value means. And from Aristotle, I, I teach in Lausanne, uh, my first... <laughs> My first lesson is about uh, political economy, <laughs> and before from oikonomios, uh, economy, uh, to uh, political ecology. And we have to understand the, the value question and the value of use. To use to, today, we have to think that it's better maybe to use than, than to possess. This is the heart of circular economy. So, of course, I didn't speak about value, but it is a, a key point. And uh, linked to the common, the question will be how do we protect our natural resources? And of course, technology is part of the problem, has to be part of the solution, but cannot be the only solution. Because even new technology, even renewable technology, the, we need extraction to produce them. So we are to collapse. Too. So we also have to think about a new model and, of course, to use technology, but not only technology. Is it really a problem if we end up late? Because I'd like to say a lot of things. Uh, yeah, it is. Oh. <laughs> so human nature, I, 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 I'd, I'd like to, to talk fast. Human nature, um, I don't know, it's a very complicated debate, but Human history, at least, if you look at human history, it's, it's, it's more or less the same. We, we had less power in the old days uh, to destroy that much. But look at what's happening now. The, the youth is in the street. Uh, they demand a zero emis emissions in 2030, which is crazy. They don't, don't even realize what it means, but it, that's good. They, they're going to realize. They're realizing um, uh, little by little. And, uh, of course, the, the, the idea is, uh, can we be happy without, with less? And uh, I'd say, yes, I, I, I don't want more, I want less. My, my, my life is a mess because there's too much. In Geneva, it's really uh, common. Um, what about value, then? Uh, um, I agree, but what, what kind of power we have to influence value? Um, I was working in this field, and I, I got into trouble because of, of what I think, what I, what I studied, actually. As a train conductor, uh, I have to be serious. If I want the same level of, ser of seriousness in this field, I, I get into trouble. If I want to work with the same level of, uh, of um, being serious in, in, in my job now, uh, I would not advise you to, to travel by train, and uh, I, I would get fired. So that's, that's a real problem, but I agree with the value. Uh, about technology now, I'm, I'm getting fast. Uh, it's a myth, of course. Look at efficiency, for example. Since the beginning of industrial revolution, of thermal industrial revolution, efficiency has, has, has grown. It's, it's getting better and better, but it's not uh, leading to um, energy saving. Because of the rebound effect, we invest the, 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 the gains, gains from, from, uh, from what we save to, to produce more, uh, to go further, and so on. It's, it's actually a, a driver of economic growth. So, so, uh, so, so uh, fourth question, we, we should, that's true, I don't remember, that's true, but we should talk about sufficiency instead of efficiency, and that's the need. But there's no business for that, and it's, it's uh, really so much linked to the, the income, the level of income, that we'd never do that. Sufficiency in housing, for example, is surface per capita. Uh, heating temperature in, mo in, in transportation, it's the amount of kilometers that you travel, the speed uh, at, at, uh, in, uh, these uh, kilometers are done. And these are much more, it, it, these had much more effect than uh, ef efficiency and renewable. And we, we focus always on efficiency and renewable because it, it has no effect on the economy, but it has almost no effect on e ecological impact. That's the problem. And uh, about advertising, I do agree. And we have now uh, an initiative in the, at the city level of Geneva. The Degrowth Network has been um, a, a big actor of this thing. Uh, we, we, there's a hope that we might vote about banning uh, posters in the street. And there's, there's people who uh, try to uh, make it not happen, and I have to say, uh, a guy who's a member of the Greens, uh, but is working in advertising. So, again, about the, the quote, that's true. Um, and that's it. 
Uh, well, I'll just quickly go. Uh, so with respect to human nature and the desire for growth, I mean, I am no philosopher and I don't think I'm in a position to comment on what drives this constant need for more. But I feel that as the movie did show towards the end that uh, human growth has progressed to the end that it has made the presence of humans itself superfluous. So it is a bit of a conundrum that perhaps we could spend more time discussing at another occasion. And then the next question was on rethinking value. Yes, uh, I guess with like evolution of, um, uh, yeah, evolution of industries and then uh, understanding with the destruction, you understand the value of the, of the forests and the natural resources. And maybe it's the very presence of those resources that adds to the wealth or the richness of uh, certain nations. Um, the third question I think was somewhere there. The person is not there anymore, but uh, <laughs> it was uh, on, globe, on green technology, I assume. Uh, I forget what the question was, but green technology has... Oh, it, 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 in, in Vell, I'm from Impact Investing, and it is not a myth in our field because we are making a big push towards uh, green technology and investing in uh, renewable methods of energy production. And because there has been, because there is such a large untapped market, there is a lot of potential for growth over there. And we, as we know that there is a, a finite amount of uh, fossil fuels that are available and eventually there will be hopefully a shift towards those other methods of energy production. Then I lose track. Um, I think what your question was about <laughs> Maybe you can discuss. C'est pas évident de suivre le, la citation. Même. Um, I think I'll maybe discuss with him. Um, maybe I could perhaps discuss this with you after. <laughs> I'm sorry, my, my knowledge of French is very poor. Même, même pour uh, uh, quelqu'un qui parle le français, c'est pas évident. C'est ça le problème. Donc, je, je, uh, I would suggest that maybe you two can have a quick chat. Um, I, I uh, urge you all again to f don't forget uh, the, the resources for the documentary. They're being given out over there. Uh, think of the pessimism of the intellect with the optimism of the will with which the documentary ended. And please join me in thanking our distinguished panelists for this evening.